I'm Eve Ekman, really happy to see many friendly, familiar faces and maybe some new faces. I wasn't supposed to be here. I'm so happy to be here. Came back for some family health stuff and was sad. I was going to miss my dear friend and colleague, Alejandro Chaul. We are so fortunate to have him here tonight. Um, really excited for what he's going to be offering us. And maybe you all have already heard a bit about Alejandro, but he is quite an impressive practitioner, scholar, author, and I am so fortunate to call him a friend and collaborator. He brings such sincerity, such kind of intense dignity to these practices he'll be offering, but also warmth and joy. So I'll give you a little bit of his background. He is a scholar, a researcher, an author, a teacher, an educator, um, and he has been focusing on Tibetan mind-body practices that he'll be sharing with you tonight. So many of us are familiar with yoga and a lot of the traditional yoga asanas that are taught here. Not as many of us are familiar with Tibetan yogas and bringing kind of mind, body, heart, spirit all together very much aligned with the reading we just completed. Many of us here were working with Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche's book. Uh, Ale has been working with Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche for 30 years, so has learned a lot from and taught a lot with and supported the programming of you know, the Bun tradition, which is really calling upon these elemental aspects of the natural world for our healing and for our soul retrieval. So we are so fortunate to have Alejandro with us and thank each of you for being here. We will, as always, um, be having some period of practice and some teaching, also opportunity for question and answer. So welcome to the Dharma Collective. Welcome Ale, welcome Erica. So wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Is this working? Yes. Okay. It can be amplified online. Okay. So I'll amplify myself over here. And thank you, Eve. Um, thank you, everyone. It's so nice to uh, to be here, uh, see some familiar faces and a lot of non-familiar faces, at least for today, but maybe from now on, they'll become familiar. Um. So when Eve invited me to come here, um, one of the things that she said is, you know, uh, there was a talk that you gave at Esalen when we were together there, and maybe you could do something from there. And of course, that's where I started. And then as I was thinking about this more, it just became from there uh, a little more than that. And I always try to update. And so... When I think bringing rainbows into one's life, it's so many different things. So I start with this image, which was actually from only a couple of weeks ago. We had a huge storm. I mean, I live in Houston. I'm originally from Argentina. Um, and, um, and now for the last 20 some years, I live in Houston. And we had an incredible storm uh, a lot of people actually lost power for some days. And then right after the storm, this amazing rainbow came out. And it was interesting to see the rainbow, but also to observe myself in the reaction of the rainbow. So the first thing I did is, of course, run to my iPhone <laughs> and catch it grasp it and then i realized wait i'm not being with it so i dropped the phone and stayed with it and wow i was in this beautiful moment of actually being in the rainbow and one of the experiences that I noticed is something that I know Eve loves as well, is this moment of awe. And I think the moments of awe allow us their doorways in. And many times, they're also doorways out. Because many times we only experience awe and we move on. 
I'll speak for myself. Maybe that's not what you do. So I'll, I'll, I know that for me, that's the case. Whether it is, you know, I'm in the Grand Canyon. Wow. Look for the camera, right? Or I'm in an incredible situation with someone and I can't stand to be with that person. So much. There's too much bliss. So there is awe is a great doorway of entrance. But then what's really important, I find, at least through practice, is to stay. Can I rest after that moment of awe and be with that? And for me, that's what practice is about. Now, it's not just to practice in moments of awe in any moment. But can I stay with it and be with that moment? And so what I want to talk about today and practice together is these opportunities that arise from moments of everyday life to moments of what we can call Dharma. And is there any difference between them? Can we really integrate them as really part of our life? And so I wanted to start, since we are at a Dharma center, but my computer doesn't think so. Let's see. Turn up the volume. I don't need that, but it should work. Okay, there we are. So this is... I don't need to say who he is, right? And for me, this was one of the great entrances of all into the Dharma. So I was just actually sharing table, some difficulties during my childhood that actually brought me to go to India. And, uh, and looking for how to relieve suffering and how to find particular doorways. And there were many. But when I met His Holiness the Dalai Lama, it was clearly a very special moment. And what was interesting was that even before I met him, I met him. So I was coming from a, from a pilgrimage in Jammu, in an Indian pilgrimage. And um, interesting enough, as uh, I, I think my, part of my life has been always interreligious. Uh, I didn't say this, but I was born in a Catholic country, Argentina, and then in a Jewish family, and then uh, traversed these different religions until I got into the Tibetan Buddhism and Burn. So I was coming down from this Hindu pilgrimage called Amarnath Cave, maybe some of you know. And as I came down, I, I was coming down walking with this Muslim family. And we were staying in a beautiful place called Pompor where saffron grows. And saffron, I don't know if you've seen the flowers, beautiful is your color, that purple color and has just the three pistols, you know, two yellow and one red. That's why it's so expensive, right? And so um, from Pampur, we biked 12 kilometers to Srinagar, the capital of Kashmir. And we did that almost daily. And one of the days we were there and in the newspaper, they had announced that Dalai Lama was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. So this was 1989. So that's why you see white hair, right? So, and it was a moment of awe. I didn't know the Dalai Lama. I didn't know too much about him, except that I had been in Ladakh seeing his picture and how the monks reacted and the care and kindness of the monks that they hosted me. But I didn't know much about him. Yet, that moment, I felt like if it was my mom or my dad getting the Nobel Prize. And I was like, so happy. 
And I didn't know why, but I was so happy. And I remember being there, savoring that happiness, being with it. And I said, I actually need to meet him. And so actually that night uh, in the Indian TV, they showed a movie called Heart of Tibet. Well, some of you may know it. And, uh, and again, so I got to learn more about the Dalai Lama, not just that initial call. And so then I got to, I went to Dharamsala where he lives. And um, I was able to actually meet him in person. And I was able to be in this long line in what they call a public blessing. And I'm coming with my Kashmiri cloth and my saffron flower to offer to him. And I do. And he says, what's your name? I can't speak. <laughs> Where are you coming from? <laughs> And of course, there's a big line behind me. So he says, he, I don't know what he actually said, but he was like, kind of, okay, keep on moving. Here's your kata back. Here's a blessing. And yeah, you know. So I go to sit on a tree that is still in the property. Start crying. crying. It was tears of joy, tears of meeting something that I was searching for a long time. And I was in that crying, it, it actually felt so joyful too. Until of course the guards came and said, you have to leave. And as I was leaving, the last person in line was a, a Japanese journalist. And he said, His Holiness, is there anything special that you can tell me? And his owner says, no, no, nothing. And as he's leaving, he says, yes. A good heart is the best religion. And I was like, wow. You know, again, it's, it sounds really simple. And if I tell my kids, they'll go, duh. <laughs> but it was really special for me. And it, it stayed with me. And so I did have to go somewhere else uh, around there and continue sitting and crying and staying with it. And so I went back to Argentina. And, um, and when I got there, the, they had invited the Dalai Lama to come. And so they said, do you want to be part of the the group bringing his holiness? I was like, yeah, I can, you know, sweep uh the doorways i can you know do whatever you need i said no no we actually need people to coordinate so i ended up being one of the coordinators and we decided to put a book together uh and we compiled different teachings of his holiness and of course we called it un buen corazón es la mejor religión a good heart is the best religion and When I allowed myself during these moments of, of staying with it, and even when I remember it, and just a, a side note that you probably already know, but I'm going to mention it anyways. This word that we use so often in Dharma, mindfulness, right? Smirti in Sanskrit or Rampa in Tibetan, comes from remembering. So when I remember, and I'm mindful of these moments, you almost have that same flavor. If I'm there, if I'm just thinking about it, they don't. But if I allow myself to drop in, they're very different. And so for me, again, this phrase, which I heard 30 some years ago, still is a great doorway 
into that heartfulness. And so, not to bore you with a lot of stories, but some more will come. But, you know, I, for me, it was important to find a practice, a teacher. And so I, at that time, naive, I went to His Holiness's office and I said, I would love to be a student of His Holiness. And, and they said, yes, you and a million others, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, they weren't as crass, but, uh, you know, and so they, so I, um, actually found a teacher and then I continue with different teachers um, until again, it was not just the intellectual part, but there was, was looking for these connections. And for me, during my practice, it's these moments that become very meaningful. And so, as I was with different teachers and doing different practices, and for those who know what the nondro is, these practices where you do 100,000 times this mantra, 100,000 times prostrations, you know, you do this, which took me seven years to finish. You know, as you do that, there's many times that you're just doing. And there's moments that you're being. And being able to notice those and being able to find more moments of, of this being. And the same with meeting different teachers. And so some years later, I started connecting to the Dzogchen tradition. Namka Rinpoche first, and particularly this symbol of ah. So what you see here is on the left is the ah, on the right is the ah with rainbows. And actually the ah with rainbows that you see there, it's from a tsakli, which is a Tibetan card that is used in different ceremonies. And it's a very classic way of symbolizing. Ah is, in the Dzogchen tradition, it's the natural state of mind. And it's usually represented, as you see there, white as crystal clear. It shouldn't be white or black, it's crystal. But sometimes it's hard to paint crystal. And so, but what happens when it's crystal, right? It's, that represents your natural state of mind. And I know that many times we think of mind and we point here, but as you probably know, and you've all contemplatives in one way or another, right? from different traditions, when we connect, when we say mind, we mean mind-heart. And this crystal aspect, if we allow the awareness to rise through the crystal, this light through the crystal becomes rainbow. So when I was still in Dharamsala, because I spent nine months, I call it my second gestation period, one of my spiritual friends told me, you know, us Tibetans, when, you know, we feel that we are a crystal, but, it, but we also have a lot of veils that cover the crystal. When he was saying that, I felt, yeah, and tar too, right? Not just veils. And he was saying, you know, of course, we when we do these practices, like the prostrations, like the mantras, like the yoga, like there are ways of clearing away these obstacles. Later, I learned this word in Tibetan, gekser, which means clearing the obstacles. Selwa, clear. Gek is exactly what it sounds. <laughs> so clearing all the gek. <laughs> right? And the gek could be physical, emotional, mental, spiritual. And we clear it through that, but also through everyday practices. So this friend of mine, Sonam, was telling me, you know, when you shower, tell me how's your shower, right? And so what I 
used to do is when I showered, I would kind of, as I showered, I would think of my day, right? So if I would be thinking of this morning as I showered, you know, I would have been thinking like, okay, we have to take the Uber at eight o'clock to get to the airport and catch the plane to San Francisco. And then, you know, so-and-so. And he's like, why'd you do that to yourself? <laughs> you know, why don't you just shower? And it's even worse many days because I think of all the people that I'm going to meet, right? And he would say, why do you bring all these people to your shower? <laughs> so if we're able to clear, then you become like a crystal. And if you allow yourself to become like a crystal or recognize yourself, your crystallinity, nature, then there's a sense of that awareness to rise like the sun at dawn and the possibility that your actions of body, of speech, of mind become like rain. So this was a teaching I heard in 1989. And I loved it. And I still savor. And so for me, the symbol of awe became really the most important symbol of my practice. I have it as my computer screen. I have it in my mug in the morning. I have it in my car. I even tattooed it here. You don't have to do that. But, you know, <laughs> but, you know, so I, you know, it's like, oh. And what that means to me is... Are you connected? Are you remembering? Are you mindful of being connected? And so the ah becomes a way of reconnecting to my inner ah. Right? So constantly an opportunity. And what in the Dzogchen tradition, the most important part is that recognition, because we all already have that natural state of mind. So no one is bringing it to you. You already have it, right? But it's the recognition. In the Tibetan tradition, we call it rigpa, right? And the non-recognition is marigpa, not realizing it. Although I like a, a, a common friend, uh, David Germano would say a better a translation that I like more, which is instead of ignorance for marigpa, it's dimmed awareness. Right? So the awareness is still there. It's just that we are dipped. We have a lot of geck, right? <laughs> and so as we do that, we're clearing and reconnecting. But this reconnecting many times is a recognition. And then again, moving on. What about recognizing and staying? So the main teaching that for me has been really valuable is this rest. Rest in that recognition. Now, rest many times for us could be this aspect that, you know, because we're stressed and we're in this fight or flight response, I'm sure uh, you've heard about this and from Eve for sure. And, uh, and so, you know, many times if we're there and we want to rest, what happens is you get into this mantra that sometimes even you do in the Shavasana posture, right? This, <laughs> and that went too far. You're now back in Marigpa, right? So you want to become awakened again. So there's so many ways of awakening and there's so many paths, right? So I'm just going to speak from the little I know from one path. But what I want to make sure is that all the paths, there's so many paths. And so, but it's important to follow and it's important to rest. So for me, that path led me to the burn tradition. And you've met, many of you have met Tenzin Wanda Rinpoche. And maybe some of you met his teacher, Lupon Tenzin Namdak, who's 99 years old. So... I had another moment of awe. So in 91, I got to meet Lopen. He was 
before his holiness the dalai lama gave the kala chakra which as many of you know it's a very important teaching and he gave it in this what i always find kind of interesting in new york because they needed a big place they were trying to find this bigger sacred place and it was the madison square garden right and so right before his holiness taught there were teachings of the five main teachers and within the Bund tradition, it was Lopen. And when I met him, I was like, wow. I was like, someone called it smitten. Smitten or smitten? Smitten. So, wow, I have to follow. And so I continued until I could, until my visas expired. And so I had to go back to Argentina. And then a couple of years later, I came back and uh, my, um, I had uh, another teacher, Shador Jorimpoche, who had cancer and was dying and I got to see him. Um, and at that same time, uh, a friend of mine from the Dzogchen tradition said, you know, there's this teacher coming, Tenzi Wondrimpoche. I said, oh, I know of him, but I never met him. So I got to meet him and it was wonderful. And then a few months later, we're in Virginia. I was doing uh, a summer program of Tibetan. And he said, you know, I'm bringing my teacher, Lopan, who you know. It's like, oh, wonderful. When I saw them together, it was one of the most amazing moments. It was this, I can still feel my cares. So it was the whole refuge tree becoming alive. And you know, I I remember back in India, someone had told me, you know, dig in many holes. But when you found find water, keep on digging in that one. So for me, that time, and that was 93, since then I've been kept on digging in this hole. So I really became focused on in this tradition, the Bern tradition. I've been studying, practicing with them, and they've been amazing. Actually, this photo I took in 2000 in Lupin's monastery, and also they were both very supportive of studying. So I continued studying, and um, and I was very lucky to go to their two main monasteries in. Uh, in Nepal, the one on the top left, uh, and then in India, Mandri, which also means medicine mountain, Mandri. And, um, and again, very, very grateful to all the different ways of learning because many times when we study, we think, yes, text, actually I brought them, but you don't need, you know, but it's not about what is written. It's about how you're connecting to the meaning. And it's the atmosphere. It's everything that you learn. So in these monasteries, there were so many things. The same like here. I mean, look around. Look at this beautiful group. Right? Be very different to be doing this somewhere else. And so, again, I invite you to take a moment to be with this group, to be fully here, to take a moment to breathe in and out and notice your sits bones on the chair or the ground and your legs on the ground, of feet, and that as you breathe, that you notice the support of the earth that is holding us all the ones here, but also the ones virtually. Right? That as we breathe and allow ourselves to be more fully here, our mind that keeps on going here and there, a little bit like a monkey. Allow it to just come back. 
as you breathe, maybe breathe mostly through your nose and, and allow that breath to come lower towards your abdomen and back through the nose as you straighten your back, maybe even stretch your arms and allow your whole backbone to stretch almost like a cat. And as you breathe in and out, allow your arms to go up and dance and move. Particularly if you've been typing a lot this morning, this afternoon, just move your fingers and your wrist and your elbows and your shoulders. And, and then when you're ready, allow the arms to come down and rest comfortably on your lap, palms up, elbows out. So the hands are together and focused and open and resting on your lap as you allow the torso to straighten but relax. Relaxing particularly that whatever you're carrying, whatever burden you're carrying, maybe in your shoulders, almost like a backpack full of rocks and just letting it go as you relax and your shoulders go down and back. And as you breathe, kind of notice that extra space that becomes available. Notice how your whole torso becomes a little more lighter. Sometimes it's described that we become like a eagle soaring in the sky. As we relax tensions in our jaw and we place our tongue in the upper palate as we relax tensions in the face and the eyes. And as we keep on breathing through the nose, we keep on relaxing areas of tension. We let the eyes rest, whether closed but not too tight or kindly open, looking to the tip of your nose and downwards in a peaceful gaze. Relaxing any tensions in your head, in your temples, in your forehead, in your brain, dropping into your body and your heart. And just breathe. And if your mind gets distracted, just gently bring it back to your breath without judging the distraction or criticizing yourself for being distracted. Just come back. Just stay breathing. Nowhere to go with the brain or the body. Just be here. As you hear and feeling maybe the support of these teachers or any of the teachers that you met that are your spiritual support and all the amazing teachers that have come through this place. Connect to this Sangha, this collective and the support of each other you support others and others support you. And breathe into that and rest with it. Celebrate the collective, almost like maybe feeling like an inner smile of joy.
just a couple more moments. And slowly, as we keep on breathing in and out, we can open our eyes, maybe open and close and look around this beautiful group. So as we know in, in the Buddha Dharma, talk about the three jewels, right? Uh, the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. So I wanted to remind ourselves the importance of Sangha in the collective here. So. so you know, as I was saying, in these places, many times we, we learn from books too, right? So we have books, and that's one of the books by Tenzin Wanda Rinpoche, Awakening the Sacred Body. So my journey led me to focus, as Eve mentioned briefly, on Tibetan yoga. And Tibetan yoga has uh, two main practices, one that we call Salung and one that we call Trungkor, and I'm not going to do too much yet on that, but it really focuses also on the subtle body. And uh, as we, the subtle body, and this is one way of the subtle body of, you have the channels, you have the chakras. And in this tradition, we, we use the five chakra system. I know other traditions use seven. It's not that we lost two chakras. Uh, there's different systems, right? And uh, and in fact, as some of the texts would say, there's actually thousands of chakras. So these are all, again, the chakras are energy centers and opportunities to notice where Gek is and to clear it, right? And if it clears it, the breath, the prana, the chi flows. And as the that flows, we can again stay. So these practices of Tibetan yoga are very useful both for this part of Getzel, but also the other part that they talk about is Bugdun, which means enhancing the meditative state. So as you're able to clear obstacles, now as you stay in that cleared space there's more possibilities for your awareness to dawn, right? And so in these practices, in these tradition, we talk very similar to Tibetan medicine. There's five kinds of breath. There's the breath that goes upward, the upward moving breath, the life force breath, the fire and equanimity breath, the downward and clearing breath and the pervasive breath. And we'll do a little bit of practice in a minute uh, of particularly with the pervasive, I think, today. And again, part of it is that each chakra allows the breath to move in all these different directions and allowing to open and clear this area so we can clear the whole body, but particularly also to stay more in the central channel. So a lot of the practices are really to stay in the central channel. And then sometimes with the same chakras, another way of waking them up is through sounds, right? And so at least in this tradition, these chakras resonate to this sound of ah, om, om, ram, sa, wow. <laughs> 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 and so with the sounds actually each one right you can even go ah oh oh And with each one, you're awakening different of the five chakras. And in fact, for 
those who have been in the Tibetan tradition, you might have noticed that when we have images, right, whether it's a, a statue or whether it's a tanka, to empower it, we use these syllables on the back, right? So that way we are empowering. And I know in, in some of the Buddhist traditions, they use om ahum rather than an ahum. That's okay. You know, different, as we say in Spanish, cada maestrillo con su librillo. Each teacher with their own little text. So that's fine. And talking about text, this is another text that I became very interested in. It's a, a Dzogchen text of the instructions of Ah, of that letter. And actually, that's uh, one of my books on the Tibetan yoga of that particular text. Um, and then, again, coming back to the central channel to really focus coming back. And part of it is that in the our usual way of perceiving the world is duality, right? And so we usually stay much more in the side channels. But when we are able to bring our mind and breath into the central channel and stay there, you start getting again these moments of awe, of non-duality, of what many times in the Tibetan tradition they call hedawa. And again, there can be moments, and sometimes it's, you know, it's like, or achu, or orgasm, these moments. But can we stay there? And if we stay, the feeling is totally different. And part of practice, right? When we use this word meditation in English, in Tibetan um, gom, it's also related to kom, which means familiarity. It's getting more and more familiar with that state of mind. And we're getting familiar both with the methods that we learn, but also with the wisdom coming back to that recognition of that awareness, right? So coming back and coming back. And so that's why, what do we call when we sit in meditation? Practice. So we're constantly practicing, right? And it's practicing, becoming familiar, becoming as we become more familiar, we start recognizing it more. And so trying to be more and more in the central channel. And part of being in the central channel is that we can radiate, right? So we connect to this pervasive breath from the central channel, radiating the text. The Mother Tantra says it's like sun rays. Right? And so you've all heard the word mandala before. And uh, and a lot of times in both tantric text and in Dzogchen, we 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 talk about the body being like a mandala, right? And the Tibetan word for that is gilkor, which means center and periphery, right? And so we have a center and periphery, and partly there's a dynamism between the center and periphery. And what you do is you know you start from the center, expand then dissolve back to the center and stay. Stay in that that has dissolved. So you've probably also seen mandalas, sand mandalas. You've probably seen that. What do they do when they finish, you know, after days of incredible work of, of these sand mandalas? What do they do at the end? They right. dissolve them. Yeah. Do you notice how do they dissolve them? Um, they actually move, but, but there's a specific direction. So from periphery back to the center. Mm -hmm. So if you notice, they go back all directions, back to the center, and then they grab that sand, and usually they take it to a river, to, except if you're one of these Western museums that want to hold on to them and so they don't let them dissolve, you know. But, but the idea is, you know, again, back to the space where everything arises and everything dissolves, which is back to ah, uh, right? And that's why it's crystal clear ah. Uh. But this energy, we call it pervasive breath, a chablung, 
And it's really an important energy that it really feeds our whole body and allows us to clear, to clear our mandala. In fact, uh, you know, in Tibetan, uh, there's a honorific and non-honorific. So what we usually talk is non-honorific, but when we talk to our teachers, to our elders, it's always in honorific. And the way to say, how are you? In honorific is kuchil sultan, which means how clear is your mandala? <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? So, but it's also kind of reflecting is, you know, yeah, how clear is my mandala? Or how gek is my mandala, right? So, so partly is again, this reflection of, okay, what do I need to bring from all my meditation tools that I have? What do I need to bring today in this moment? Because as you know, every moment is an opportunity to be in Rigpa or in Maritpa. Every moment. And so partly is, can we choose Rigpa? Even though, as we know, the majority of the time we choose Maritpa. So, but the more that we become aware and we choose Rigpa, the more that we can stay. And as we stay and become familiar, we can be more connected. And this is also an image of connectivity. Connectivity to ourselves and also through this pervasive breath is how we interconnect, right? So again, for me, when I think of Rigpa is also connectedness, right? reawakened, connected. And I'm gonna use a metaphor that Tenzi Wanjiru Rinpoche, he probably realized when, when he was teaching that uh, he loves these in kind of technology metaphors. And I think most of us are old enough to remember when the internet was not just like here, okay, give me the password, right? It was something like D and when we got to the D, now we we're connected, not just to it, we're connected to the world wide web. And then of course we get disconnected, right? Particularly at that time, you know, all the so we have to all again. But this is also what we do in practice, right? So we we connect through whatever practice, you know, whether it's a mantra, whether it's a, a, a yoga posture or movement, whether it's uh, silence, whatever is the way in, we connect. And once we connect, we can stay a little bit and then we disconnect. And when do we need to reconnect? And so what is the didi 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 that you're using, right? And then you have to choose. And so... All these ways are parts of reconnecting. So again, you know, a lot of times, actually today, a friend of mine told me, you know, she was with a friend whose dog was passing and says, what's the mantra? What's the mantra that we use, right? I said, well, what do you know? What are you already familiar with? Mm -hmm. Right? It's not an, that's not the time to learn something new, right? So this becoming familiar with all these tools are so when the moment comes, you use it. It's not the time to start learning something new when that moment comes. So that's why we practice. So when those moments arise, we have to practice, right? And so when we do that, again, every time it's an opportunity to connect. And so, um, Again, this is the last text that I'm showing. Uh, this is uh, another of my favorite uh, practices, uh, which is also on, on the Tibetan yoga. And this is um, my last book on it. And uh, you may see that those texts, and actually now that I see them too, you know, you can see they, they, look, uh, they look like if they're stained, but actually that's a blessing. And um, so... I always carry these texts. Actually, I have them in my backpack here. And uh, so I was traveling to Tibet 
And um, then I, I met this great teacher in the Bern tradition, uh, the actually the holder of the lineage of, of Tompa Shenrap, the, um, the, um, the Buddha that uh, became the beginning of the Bern tradition. Um, and so um, the way that, it's, you know, in that tradition, instead of signing, they put their thumb. So those red symbols are thumbs. So for me, again, these are a, a way also to, it's every time I hold them, it's like connecting uh, to that as well. And this is an image that we use a lot. We call it tapiritsa. And, um, and if you see that white crystal clear, it's like the ah, right? And again, if you're connected, what happens when you connect? Through the crystal, you have rainbows. And again, over and over in this tradition, it's this way of connecting. And when you're connecting, it's rainbows. But it's also this aspect of rainbows. It's not just light. It's also warmth, right? It's also the immeasurable qualities, right? It's loving kindness, is compassion, is joy or empathetic joy and it's equanimity and the other 83,797 you know so there's there's all these qualities that arise so when I'm saying rainbows here don't think of just light or colors right there's all these qualities there's all these aspect of of warmth and this is for me the warmth you know, so this is a picture, uh, recent picture, actually, Rinpoche, Tenzin Rinpoche went to visit Lopen. And uh, this is a picture that they, they took. And for me, this is the liveness of the tradition. Yes, like the photo I took back in 2000, them studying together and all. But this for me is my refuge tree, right? So when I see this is, again, fully connected, right? This is full, the warmth of this lineage or any lineage, right? But it's this connection, this, that arises through this warmth, this, um, from that. And I could stay here forever, um, and then again, um, one of the ways that um, I met Eve actually was through um, research, right? And um, and um, I worked for 20 years at MD Anderson, which is a, a cancer center in Houston, in integrative medicine. And, and through that, uh, doing research with these practices in different cancer populations. And uh, as I was looking on that, I remember that the logo that we used for, we had one for Indian yoga and it was pink, right? Because we, most of our population was breast cancer. And then when we did for Tibetan yoga, I chose rainbow, right? Uh, and, uh, and so again, it's, um, I'm not going to talk now about the research, but that was always, uh, it's an area that for me has become a great unifier of kind of the science and the spirituality. Um, again, the, the, the whole area of mind and life and where the Dalai Lama has been crucial in promoting the dialogue and these practices and um, and actually, Tenzu Wanjiru Rinpoche as well has been amazing in, in promoting that. We've done a number of um, uh, conferences on that, and I keep on doing things online. In fact, yesterday I was uh, meeting with another colleague, uh, uh, Eric Garland, and one of the things uh, I like what he's researching now, it's called Savoring the Moment. And uh, And again, using these moments about staying and savoring and his research is particularly for addictive behaviors and and using all the five senses right and and being able 
to come into back into that moment of connection, which again, it's very much the same in the Dzogchen tradition as in many traditions. So again, this meeting of the science and different spiritual um, ways of, of connecting, I find very, very useful. And so for a practice, one of the ways that it's defined this aspect of the crystal heart mind, the, the way that they are defined is you start with Scott, right? You start a lot of times in the philosophical traditions, they call it emptiness, right? Uh, Rinpoche would prefer, and I prefer too, this word spaciousness. So what sometimes would call sky-like mind. Because it's not empty in the sense of vacuum. It's exactly the opposite. It's spaciousness so everything can arise. So, and it's interesting how, because it's everywhere, we almost don't see it, right? If I ask you what you see in the photo, you're probably gonna tell me mountains and clouds and very few people say sky you know, or space, you know, but space is what allows all of that there. And what we are trying to recognize in our practice and stabilize is in that space, right? And we have practices like what we call sky gazing, right? And what we do is gaze to the sky. And I remember a long time ago, we were actually with Lopon and Rinpoche in New Mexico, beautiful sky, right? And so Lopon said, we sat on a mountain and he said, just look at the sky. And after a while, a couple of people were like, but what are we looking? <laughs> just sky. And it's like, for what, right? And so part of we, we don't realize all the supports that we have and that what we want to cultivate is exactly that open space and that when we recognize it is like the sun in that space right is that awareness and so through that awareness now is the light shining and meeting the crystal or the sky. And then, of course, rays and rainbows. So that's, you know, like the sense of now. Now, again, what happens at the rainbow level? This is many times where we disconnect, right? Because it's almost like I got it. And exactly the moment that you say you got it, most of us is where we lose it. Why? Because we grasp it, right? I got it as I grasp it. I want to get my iPhone to take my rainbow, right? But what about if we stay? What about if we allow ourselves to stay in that rainbow? Then that's more opportunities of bringing it into our daily lives. So another practice that I like, and this is, again, Tenzi Wanja Rinpoche, uh, recently, you know, we, we had a conference on, on wellness in April. And uh, and again, this is something that it's known, but sometimes we don't think of it this way. And so he talks about how, you know, every day 1% of our cells die, you know, are renewed, right? So there's billions of cells dying, billions of cells being born, but can we be aware of that? And can we allow, as we let those go, when we, breathe in, kind of nourish those new cells, bring breath, bring light. And in a way, you feel that you can re-nourish your whole system. So in the, again, that pervasive breath can be very helpful. And this is one exercise that I love to do, and I think we can do here. I think we have enough space, we'll, we'll see. And this is a practice from the Tibetan yoga tradition. We'll see how we can, maybe we'll, I'll modify it a little bit so you don't kind of hit each other as you, uh, so, but I'll tell you it has, it's a breathing practice, movement and breathing practice that has four parts. 
And we start by exhaling. So we exhale, and when we exhale, we crunch down. Maybe if we want to let go more, we go, you know. So, and as we exhale and let go, we pause, and then we inhale and re-nourish all those cells that are being born or being renewed. You bring in that breath into your body, and now you hold. You pause. So your mind and breath are into your body. Now you hold. And instead of exhaling now, this is one of the precious moments, is called re-inhalation. It's what Lopon would call igniting the medicine. So you re-inhale. Now that breath expands, and as it expands, it moves your whole body almost like if you you know for those who do qigong or tai chi kind of let that prana that chi expand and you know expand in whatever direction it it's good for you and others around you and as you expand you hold there and then when you're ready you let go so when you let go Again, very important, now you rest. So the rest, again, is that equanimity posture, right? So one hand on top of the other. Usually we put the thumbs on the base of the ring fingers, elbows out, so that we can rest. And as we rest and relax, this part of the posture that we call like the eagle soaring in the sky, right? It's not the flying. The flying, usually it's this part, right? What about when you stop that and you just soar, glide? You know, we have even actually in, in the scientific community, they use this word for mind, flow. So the sense of staying and flowing in a way is also being in that sense of that light, those rainbows. So I'm, I'm going to do it once all together so you see it. Um, and I hope you see it on the camera too. Let me know if there's a need to 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 shift something, and and then we'll do it together a couple of times, and then in the resting, we're gonna continue staying. Okay, so this movement goes like this. So, before we start, I want you to check in. And check in, is there anything that you're ready to let go? Maybe it's been something that you've been carrying a long time. Maybe it's an armor that has been useful, actually, for a while. But maybe it's ready to let go. Maybe there's something that you want to let go. Just notice. And don't get into the stories of blame or shame. Just notice if there's anything that you feel now ready to let go. Although you want to try and let go, at least for a little bit, and feel how it is to be with that armor for a little bit. Breathing in and out. Bless you. Checking in that space that maybe it's cluttered. Again, no judgment, no criticism. The intention is that with the movement, we get it a little more uncluttered. Just also remember that even if it's not totally uncluttered, just a little bit of space has the same quality that all space. So just whatever we could do is fine for now. So breathing in and out one more time. In the next, we're going to exhale. Inhale. Re-inhale and expand. 
Exhale, let go. Hands in equanimity for a moment, back straight, shoulders relaxed, heart very open. We do it again. Expand a little more. Exhale, let go. Hands in equanimity. One more time. Expand a little more. Exhale, let's go. Hands in equanimity, back straight, shoulders relaxed, heart area open. Breathe and rest. The eyes can be closed, but not too tight or kindly open. Whatever is good for you in this moment as you rest. If your mind gets distracted, gently bring it back to your breath that you can visualize as that green light. Centered through your whole central channel. That connection, it can expand throughout from the center to periphery. Maybe a sense of inner smile, particularly in that place that you are able to let go with that new space and recognition of that space, there's a little more light, a little more rays. That space that becomes available, the light illuminates it, creating rays, expanding through your heart. Nourishing every cell of your heart. Nourishing every cell of your whole body. Like that expansive rays, green rays of light. Nourishing every cell of your body, every channel, every chakra. Nourishing you emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and expanding beyond your body to the whole room, into the virtual space. Letting those rays expand from here to the whole of San Francisco or wherever city you are in and expanding to that state, to that country, to the whole world. That sense of sharing benefits of the practice like those rays of light touching everyone's hearts. With all those qualities of loving kindness, of compassion, of joy, of equanimity. That intention of clearing our mandala and clearing everyone's mandala. 
microcosm and the macrocosm. Slowly, close and take a moment to notice, to savor, to be in that state of mind. Noticing that every moment we have a choice of reconnecting. Even as we slowly open our eyes, we can maintain that connection. And if we notice that we lose it, we can close again. And we can open again. I notice the support of the group. And always remember that there's so many supports that we don't remember. And so part of the practice is finding ways of support, whether it's the ah, whether it's the sangha, whether it's your teachers, all these ways of support and ways of practicing. And so to me, one of my favorite ways of thinking is that, you know, each of us have different aspects of mud in our life. And so we're all lotuses. Right? So we grow from that mud. And as Thich Nhat Hanh would say, no mud, no lotus, right? But even more important is that if we, each of us is a lotus, we are like this, a pond of lotuses. Mm -hmm. So that's our collective. That's our sangha and supporting each other in being like that. Mm -hmm. And so the sense of connecting, helping each other flourish, supporting each other as we do that. And so for me, laughter is another way of connecting. And and this is a picture that I love. I didn't take this picture. <laughs> but it's His Holiness with uh, Reverend Desmond Tutu. And I hear that every time they meet, they laugh. And as you see, everyone around them are laughing. And I think they have no clue of what <laughs> His Holiness and Desmond Tutu are laughing. But still contagious. So uh, there's a lot of good research on laughing. And so uh, it's always useful. Um, this is another way for me of warmth. That's my family uh, recently and being together, uh, other moments of warmth. And um, I wanted to let you know of things both online and in person. Actually, the one there is tomorrow, uh, right? Uh, not too far. It's in uh, Point Richmond. So if you want to do a, a, a day uh, of uh, Tibetan yoga, tomorrow I'm teaching uh, at actually, it's called Hidden City Ballroom. So it's a ballroom. We'll dance too. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're welcome to come. And again, it's also Dana. So no no specific fee. Just join us. Um, and then things online. Um, uh, I do actually also meditaciones en español. Cada mes hago una meditación. Uh, la próxima es el 10 de julio. So you can join us. All you have to do is go to mbsihouston.org. Um, then in English, I do one on June 17th. Um, and then we have other teachers doing uh, things every Tuesday and Thursday. So you're welcome to join to any of those. And those are free. Um, on the weekend, I'm going to be in Esalen, if anyone, uh, I don't know if there's still space, but uh, but then in August, I'll be in Omega, so I'm looking forward to that too, to go to the East Coast, for those, if anyone online is in the East Coast. And there's a lot of things online um, that are available through apps. A lot of people like to meditate with apps, uh, so uh, particularly I use uh, Hay House or Empower You. Uh, so, and actually one of my books uh, is also in in that app. Um, so those are, again, supports through the books. Courses, uh, actually a new Tibetan yoga course with wisdom is coming up. So uh, if you're interested, I, uh, actually they're doing some bundle programs and I can tell you if anyone is interested in that. But really bringing rainbows to our 
like this is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, actually, I, I I used to have that T-shirt, and uh, for those who like the Beatles, and uh, and so uh, this is another way of thinking of rainbows, and so this is also my new logo, um, and particularly being in, in Rainbow Month also. So, um, so uh, thank you, and I think we have some time for questions or whichever way you want to take it. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I have a quick I have comment a from the. Uh, can you remove the presentation so we can get a nice big picture of you? I don't know if you want a picture, but yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Is that good? Yeah, yeah, we got a lot of good information. So thank you. I really appreciate being able to see You're you. Welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Nice to be seen. Questions, comments, rainbows. Yes. I have a bit of a technical question. Will okay. you ask and the mic for so that everyone can? And I actually had the chance to ask um, Lama Sultra Malayana this question, and she said, I don't know. Um, but I'm wondering if you know, is there something particular about the Bon tradition that made it receptive to non-dualism? Mm. I think it's not just the Bon tradition. Um, I, you know, uh, particularly in the burn tradition, one of the, you know, the main, the most important part of the teaching is Dzogchen. So Dzogchen itself is, it's non-dualism. And so, um, and because in the burn tradition, when we talk about the nine ways of burn, the highest one is uh, Dzogchen, that is why it's so important. And what's interesting is uh, Lupin Tenzing Namdak once was asked about, you know, what, why do you have nine ways of burn and, and why you as, a, you know, someone who's meditated so much, why do you still do all the other things? Why do you still do rituals? Why do you still do, uh, you know, offerings and so forth? He says, well, we do them from that state of mind or non-dual. So whatever we are doing becomes a Dzogchen practice. So even if we're doing a tantric practice, we're doing a sutric practice, if you're doing it from the Dzogchen perspective, it's always non-dual. So it's always from that perspective that we do things. And if we can't, then we go back to dualism until we can get back to non-dualism. So that's how we kind of fold, kind of again, from the center to the periphery, to the from the periphery back to the center. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, that's so helpful it's online, but you could also repeat the question if it's too hard to... Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't even know if this question is intelligible, but maybe that's because I'm confused. It's a question about practice. So um, I generally do Shamatha Vipassana practice, and at some point I try to do the practice of resting my mind in awareness. And um, it's not very restful. <laughs> it's, and that's where my question lies. It, it involves effort. And it's almost like, I feel like I'm resting my mind in the space and I can kind of hear my synapses firing with little bits and beginnings of thoughts, but then I come back to space and to resting in awareness. And I can keep this up for maybe, you know, 45 seconds before it's too too much. It's too tiring because <laughs> it's, it's not restful. It's, um, and... I'm not sure, this is going to sound silly, but I'm not sure what the point is. <laughs> you know what I mean? What the point in resting is? 
it doesn't seem to have carryover. Mm. It's like I'm doing a g- mental gymnastic, and I think maybe I'm going about this wrong. Well, I think you know we're we're so used. So our, our habitual tendency is to do the gymnastic. We're so non-habituated to rest. It's so difficult for us because what we're taught, at least, you know, most of us all our lives is keep on doing, right? And uh, in a way is, you know, it reminds me, a, a friend of mine would say, you know, we we tend to be always here, right? And this is the human doing. Can we shift into the human being? And it's so hard. And so that's why it's practice and it's getting familiar with the resting, which is not familiar for the most of us. And so it's hard, it's effort. And the effort is because we keep on holding, can we let go? And can we allow ourselves to be comfortable in letting go? Because usually we, this is where we feel safe. And then letting go usually is spacing out. Thank you. So that's the other part, right? So sometimes letting go, it is also out. So finding the tools that help you refocus, then let go from there without spacing out so that's why the grounding practices are so important right so that you stay grounded and let go from there so you still grounded in the burn tradition you know that we the elements are so important we when we talk about grounding usually the first element that we think of right that 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 we are taught is earth particular we say be like a mountain and so you know we're like a mountain right and we stay straight and and so we train in being grounded like earth quality and that's important but if you live here or if you live in costa rica or you live in you know there's earthquakes they're not it's not as not as stable right and so when we notice that, actually the most stable element, the groundest element is space. When you are able to be grounded in space, nothing can destroy space. You can have missiles through space. Space is fine. But when you're not grounded in space, you're spacey, right? That means you're not connected to space at all. So partly is being able to connect to space. Now in practices, that's also going from kind of focused attention and kind of grounded that there's a lot of effort to being able to let go and still maintain the attention with being more open. And again, takes that practice of focusing expanding, maybe refocusing because I lost it, I'm expand and it takes it takes time and it's going from effortful to effortless. but it takes time. And partly is also patience, right? We most of us want things now and we say it doesn't work. Well how how long did you try it, right? Or are you doing all the things that you need to do, getting all the, not just the main thing, but all the circumstances that can support you and find ways of supporting in that way? Does it make some sense? Yeah. It sort of sounds like keep it up. (laughs) I keep practicing. Yeah. Keep letting, you know, it's, I think it's, it's hard. We were talking at table too, right? You know, I, I, I was talking to a friend and I was mentioning my own ways of, of holding on. And, and, and I said, yeah, I know I need to let go. And he said, or oh, you can keep on holding. 
<laughs> and so that's our that's our tendency, right? To to keep on holding. That's where we feel that we can have control. But actually, if we're able to let go and stay, things flow and settle in their place. Thank you. And so the other welcome, the other part that I think it's important there is um what the Tibetans call ding, which is confidence and trust. And that is built, it's not faith as in kind of blind faith, is is this confidence that comes from practice, from you know, you do it, and you connect, and then you disconnect. But you did connect. So you try it again and you connect, and maybe you connect a little more and you disconnect. But you try again, you connect, and maybe a little more. And so every time you connect, you're reconnected to that place and gaining a little more familiarity and a little more confidence. And as you get more confidence, that's important because that's what gets you back into knowing this is the way to connect. Yeah. yeah. Uh, going back to the last uh, syllable, right? And then you have the other four others, right? The the um, the hung, and other two. So how do they play with each other? I mean, they are they support they are, or they are like uh, yeah, they uh, are different experiences of what? Well, yeah, it's uh, we're gonna try and yeah, it's because that's a very long yes, uh, but, but, but so in a way you can think of. Ah, as being the main one, and I'm going to use uh, uh, examples from Rinpoche. You double click on the ah, and becomes Oman Hung, right? Okay. And you double click on the Hung, and becomes Ramanza, right? So sometimes we do practice just with ah, sometimes we do Aum Hung. And if you've been with Rinpoche in any of the Cyber Sangha, you hear all the time. Ah, oh, 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 oh. So it's ah, oh, oh. and then sometimes we do Ramanza as well. And usually it's kind of a body, speech, mind, and quality and action. Those are the five parts. Yep. Okay. And I think this is the last one I, I can see. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. It's a technical question. The breathing exercise that you took us through um, when you excel in the beginning, is it just through the nose and inhale just through the nose? Yeah. So in these practices, actually, they're all through the nose. Um, and if you uh, remember that um, graphic that I showed of the channels, right? So you have, so the central channel goes all the way to the crown the side channels come through the nose. So in a way, you're breathing in through the side channels into the central channels and the central channel. And as you breathe out, it goes out. So you're always just using the nose for, for these movements. Of course, if you're using the mouth, it's not wrong, but it's better if you use the nose. Thank you. already kind of dedicated to Mary and Bob at the end.
So I dedicate the merits for all beings without exception. And sometimes we use this metaphor that it's like pouring nectar in the ocean so that everyone can drink from it, including ourselves. Thank you, Ale. Thank you, thank you. Please come back again and visit us. Please um, do a day long with us. So wonderful to get more of these practices and movements.